Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 20th of July, 2023. We had a great guest for you. A first time guest, Jim Bianco. He's a president of Bianco Research based out of Chicago. One of my homes that I've had many, many years ago. Well, Jim's going to come on and we're going to talk big picture. We're going to talk about the Fed. We're going to talk about inflation. We're going to talk about innovation, uh, his favorite investment for the next 10 years. But, you know, Jim might be a bit of an outlier. He thinks that inflation's going to be sticky. He thinks it hangs around between 3 and 4%, which forces the Fed to continue to raise interest rates. All that being said, we're going to find out if Jim thinks there's a recession on the horizon and what really happened last year. All that and more coming up right now on Making Money. Over 1 million people around the world follow Wall Street veteran Mark Chaikin for his shockingly accurate stock market predictions. He just gave them a dire warning. Mark says, we're about to witness an historic stock market shakeup that can soon create devastating losses for investors who don't know what's coming. And as a result, you only have 90 days to move your money. You see, Mark spent 50 years on Wall Street at some of the most prestigious hedge funds in history. And he's been on Fox Business and CNBC countless times. But this is a financial story no one else is telling. And if you let this take you by surprise, you could be in for a world of pain. He explains everything in a brand new free report available at rollingcrash2023.com. He includes a name and ticker of a popular stock that could be directly impacted by what's happening as well. Mark warned of the beloved pet brand Chewy before it fell 45%. Tech company C Limited before it fell 66%. Furniture company Wayfair before it fell 76%. Social media favorite Snap before it fell 36%. And food delivery company DoorDash before it fell 65%. Mark even called the Amazon crash before the Fang stock fell 35%. So you want to avoid the stock in this new report immediately. Again, simply go to rollingcrash2023.com for your free copy of this new report. All right, without further ado, here he is, Jim Bianco, making his uh, premiere here on Making Money. Thanks so much for joining us, Jim. Um, I've been following you for a very long time. Uh, I've seen you do uh, the tours of the uh, financial media uh, on Twitter. Um, So, you know, I I think the information put out there is fantastic. So I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. So let's jump into this market. I, I mean... It's undeniable that uh, the momentum is higher right now. Um, I did a, uh, a Twitter Spaces thing for, for a, a colleague of mine yesterday. And, you know, it's only like nine other speakers. It's crazy people talking over each other. But, Jim, most people were still negative. They're still talking about recession. They're still talking about the Fed messing up what they're doing. Yet the S&P and the Nasdaq are hitting a 52-week high. How do you view the market right now? Well, I mean, to your first part, yeah, everybody's negative because – we're still struggling with this idea. The Fed has raised rates over 500 basis points. And the week we're talking, the following week is going to be the next meeting. And the market is putting like literally a 97% chance they're going to raise rates again at the next meeting. And we've all been trained and it's historically a fact that when the Fed raises rates like to that degree, it hurts and the economy should struggle. And that I think is the big reason why we are looking at this idea that there must be some kind of a slowdown and there must be some kind of an impact from all of those rate hikes. Add to that, you mentioned about, you know, the market being back to 52-week highs. Now, until a few weeks ago, I know the market's rally has been broadening out in the last few weeks. It has been extraordinarily how concentrated this rally had been. For the first, till the middle of June, Seven stocks led the entire S&P up more than 10%. The other 493 stocks were down on the year until like about a month ago. Now, those other 493 stocks are recovering somewhat, uh, but it has been. So if you were to look at what's the message of the market? Well, 493 stocks weren't doing anything. And that's like the entire economy. And so there's a message there that the economy was struggling I don't think NVIDIA and Microsoft and Apple are maybe indicative of the economy. And those stocks are zooming, throw in Tesla then too, another stock almost up 100% this year. So yeah, it's been a very confusing, very confusing environment. I think it starts with that big rise in rates. So let me ask you this, you know, 
the rates obviously they've they've gone up, like you said, five hundred basis points. Another twenty five most likely next week, and maybe they pause again after that. Maybe not. I think it's irrelevant they do another twenty five. I don't think it really matters long term. But you know, and and you said that affects the economy, obviously. But you know, the the pullback that we had in twenty twenty two, and you know the the. Low, the small cap stocks and, and the high growth stocks getting crushed until this rally began basically October-ish last year. Was that all this priced in already? Was the market pricing this in? Or do we need to reprice stocks based on interest rates going up over 500 basis points in about a year and a half? Well, I don't think it was necessarily all priced in because you're right. You know, small cap stocks got crushed and continued to, I mean, they made their low in October, but continued to do nothing until literally three or four weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, and even though they've lifted, they haven't lifted a whole lot. You know, big cap tech stocks, I mean, there's been a narrative there for you because last year the narrative was all about higher rates, their long duration stocks, it's hurting the stock market. And I joke, yeah, and the, the fix for them being crushed by higher rates was even higher rates to kick off another bull market. Yeah. Uh, but that narrative all got changed with ChatGPT and with AI. And now those stocks have got, you know, the bit in their teeth and they're just running with this idea that there's going to be this next, next major technological wave of uh, AI that's coming in, that these companies are going to be the forefront and the winners in, in, that, in that race. So I think that's what's really been going there. But I'll come back to what I said before. If you were to eliminate those seven stocks and you were to say, what's the message of the stock market? Got crushed till October traded sideways, didn't do a whole lot of anything until about a month ago. It's had a little bit of a lift in the last month. That's pretty consistent with the measure or the, the narrative you're hearing from people. The economy is going to slow. These interest rate hikes are going to hurt and everything else. But that's not the world we live in. The world we live in, 30% of the S&P is seven stocks. And those stocks are on average, those seven stocks are up almost 60% this year. And they're really just taking SPY and all the indices with them along for the ride, even though you could argue the bifurcation in the market is one of the greatest that we've ever seen. Yeah, you, you make a great point. I saw the numbers. I think it came out Monday. I think the the, the big seven was up 58%. The rest was up 4%. So he's, like you said, they were negative, that 4 or 93. So they've turned around. Um, so do, do you see the second half of your setting up for potential for the rest, let's call it, the 493 to do well. Or even we talk about small caps, you know, Russell 2000 is closing in on 52-week highs. It's really been rallying as of late, you know, small mid caps. Do you see maybe money shifting out of these big tech names? Because it doesn't look like this train's slowing down. No, it, it, it's not slowing down. I think that something's going to have to change in the environment. Otherwise, what we see happening will just continue. Now, what could that be that change? I've argued, let me back up a second. For the last 18 months, there's been a constant when it comes to the Fed. Everybody underestimates what the Fed's going to do. They're going to pause. They're going to step down. They're going to stop. They're going to reverse. They're going to pivot. And they never do any of that stuff. They just keep raising rates and raising rates and raising rates. Um, and now the, uh, the, the new narrative is next week is going to be the last rate hike. Of course, this is the fourth time I think now we've said that this is going to be the last <laughs> yeah. rate hike. I guess we keep saying it long enough. It'll eventually be right. Um, but in the idea is we finally vanquished inflation. It's down to 3% and uh, it's on its way to 2 I've pushed back on that narrative a little bit. I think we're bottoming on inflation for the year. I'm talking about year over year inflation now. And I think that, you know, over the rest of the summer and into the fall, the 3% year-over-year -year inflation is going to maybe creep back towards 4%, not 10 or 15, but towards 4 If that happens, there's going to be a rate hike next week. There's going to be another rate hike this year. And I've even thrown out the idea that there could be even a third rate hike, a third rate hike. Right. I'll remind everybody back in January that Jamie Dimon came out in January, of, I'm sorry, January of 2022 and said, I could see six or seven rate hikes this year. Uh, and what he meant by six or seven is six or seven 25 basis point rate hikes. Everybody's like, wow, six or seven. What's he smoking that he thinks the Fed's going to move that much? <laughs> well, he was wrong. We didn't have six or seven rate hikes. We had 21 is what we wound up having. And so the point is, is that's how we completely overestimate the Fed. So I find it interesting when I say, look, there could be a third rate hike this year. People are like, whoa, a third rate hike. I'm like, Look, we've had 23 of them when we might have a 24th. Why is the 25th such a big deal? And it goes to the mindset that everybody has. Fed can't keep doing this. 
But if the inflation rate continues towards 4%, yes, they can. And if the inflation rate continues towards 4% and there's that second, third rate hike coming after the next week, then I think that could be a narrative change for the market. Uh, and then that could be a real problem. And what is that narrative change? I like to joke that the problem with the economy might be that there is no problem with the economy, that this talk of a recession that's always six months out but never arrives is wrong and that we're not going to have a recession. Oh, great. Except now we're going to have four or five percent inflation and we're going to have to live with a five or six percent interest rate world if that's if that is the, the, the case. And that will definitely kill the whole Tina argument because there is an alternative. I'm happy to sit around in a five and a half or six percent money market fund uh, if, uh, you know, and you tell me that the stock market's going crazy. I'm not that perturbed because I'm getting five or six percent with no risk as opposed to zero, which is what we had pre-COVID. And that could become the narrative shift is that that inflation environment stays a lot stickier than people think. So let me let me ask you, Jim, what what is the basis behind potentially uh, seeing inflation go back to four percent? Um, you know, I, I'm not disagreeing with it, but the, the one thing that I see is, you know, the shelter, you know, that's still it was over a third this past reading of, of the CPI. It's such a lagging indicator when it comes to CPI versus looking at actual prices of uh, rentals and homes coming down. Uh, you know, every indicator uh, on, on the ground in the crater is showing that it's rolled over months ago. And you're starting to see a little bit roll over in shelter. Won't that kind of rolling over in the next few months keep it down where it is? Or do you think there's other uh, components of the CPI that's going to push that up? Well, yeah, there's two ways you can look at the inflation rate. You could talk about breaking down the components. And you're right. The shelter component should start to come down. That's owner's equivalent rent and rent of primary residence. Uh, people like to compare that to, you know, Redfin, Zillow, Apartments.com, uh, measures of rentals. And those numbers have come down huge. And they mm -hmm. say that the, the shelter component should come down. And that's not wrong. Uh, the only pushback I give is that the shelter component in inflation measures all rents. And so what do we know about the vast, vast majority of rents? They're unchanged. You signed a lease. Mm -hmm. They measure rents every six months. And so they, they ask you six months ago, what was your lease? Uh, what was your rental? Rent your rental cost. Then they ask you today. It's the same. I'm under the same lease. So the vast majority of it is unchanged. So that shelter component should come down because the new rentals are lower, uh, because that's all Redfin and Zillow measures, just new rentals. They don't consider that 80% of rents are unchanged. Yep. So it should come down, but not nearly as much. And yeah, you could look at airline tickets. You could look at you know used cars. You could look at food. You could look at energy. Put all that stuff into the mix. And what I think you'll find when you look at a components analysis is Look at where the inflation rate was a year ago. A year ago of July of last year, the CPI, monthly CPI was zero. Now, we're estimating, we being Wall Street, not me in particular, are estimating that July of this year is going to be about 0.3.4. So that means we're going to go from 3.0 to 3.2 or 3.3. Last year, August was 0.2 for the month. If we get another 0.3.4 in August, We'd be near three and a half by September. So that would be on the component side of looking at the inflation rate bottoming now. It's called the base effect that if you compare from a year ago, the numbers were very, very small a year ago. Now, and then if you throw in the idea that, you know, crude oil prices are moving higher and that will push up gasoline, gasoline's in CPI, not crude oil, uh, then you could actually see that number nudge a little bit more. But let me step back and make another little quick comment for you. There's also the bigger picture. And what I like to talk about in the bigger picture is we're in a post-pandemic economy. That's a fancy word. What does it mean? In the September of 2020, I think we still forget. When, we, when somebody asks me, what is the most significant economic event of my lifetime? It is the first quarter of 2020. And it will always be the first quarter of 2020. It's not the 87 crash. It's not the great financial crisis. I'm not old enough to be around for the Great Depression. Uh, but it, so it is the first quarter of 2020. We shut down the global economy. A week before we did it, we didn't even think that was conceivable. And then we restarted it. And the ramifications coming out of that are we're going to spend the rest of our life trying to understand. You know, the one we're all familiar with is work from home, remote work. That became a thing. The biggest change in the labor market in 150 years is literally is what that was since we invented the eight hour workday in the 1880s. Um, 
because now that eight hour workday is no longer a thing. And because of that, and you know, the supply chain problems and everything else, I think we've got structurally higher inflation in the post pandemic world, three or 4% structurally higher from two. Now, not 10 or 15, and but three or four means that four or 5% might be neutral on interest rates. Might That might be neutral. When the Fed wants to cut rates because the economy's slowing, they're going to three or two and a half. And when they want to tighten, they're going to six or seven. Gone are the years of zero interest rates for year on year on year. That era is over. So now markets are going to have to contend with investment decisions. Mortgages are going to have to contend with real interest. I mean, substantial interest rates that we're not used to for if you compare the 15 years or so before the pandemic. And it's all because of this major shift or this major event of shutting down and we rebooted the U.S. economy. And guess what? All the software didn't load exactly the same way as it did pre-pandemic. And now we have to start to figure out what has actually changed. Yeah, Jim, that's a really great way to look at it. I haven't heard that before. And that, that's, that's fantastic. Do you think that uh, at some point the Fed, um, Wall Street investors will be OK if we set the benchmark for inflation, let's say at 3 percent, not 2 percent? You know, where did the 2 percent come from? Why, why has that been the number? And because you said we, the economy's changed forever. So can we not change that benchmark? Is 3% okay? Can we set it there if real wages are a little bit higher and people are still making money? Okay, so on your first part of your question, um, I'm going to speak really technical here. The All the central banks pulled the 2% number out of their ass. They just basically invented <laughs> it about 15 years ago. They said, you know, one's too low, three's too high, let's go with two. I mean, it's literally, that's what you get when you put a bunch of PhDs together in a room. All right, <laughs> but it seemed at the time to be a reasonable number. Why don't they move it to three or move it to four or something like that? That gets very tricky because they've got two issues they got to deal with. One issue they got to deal with is Fed credit or central bank because they all have it. The ECB and the rest of them, we also use 2% is central bank credibility. You start moving your target when it becomes inconvenient because that's what we're talking about now. Yeah. Then you have no credibility. You can move it when you're back to 1% because then it, it would be credible. But second, and I think more importantly, in May of last year, May of 22, Jay Powell went to the White House. And that was when the inflation rate was 8.5% on its way to 9. And President Biden was, this was an Oval Office meeting, literally pointed at Jay Powell, pointed at him, and said, It is the job of the Federal Reserve to bring down inflation. And he said, America, you hate this inflation. Here's your guy. He's going to make it go away. And so he got his marching orders. And their credibility is on the line that they have to get back to two. Now, let me throw in one other mix and some one other thing into the mix. If you look at studies by Bankrate.com or the Federal Reserve itself, and this is really alarming if you're not familiar with it, something like 55 to 60 percent of the American public has less than ten thousand dollars of savings. Something like 20 percent have zero savings. They have literally nothing. Uh, and of those 55 or 60 percent, they say that they cannot come up with a thousand dollars in an emergency. Now, Jay Powell, whenever he starts his press conference, says that we are here to work for the American people, that if we don't get inflation down, we don't have an economy and we understand the hardships that inflation imposes on everybody. If we tolerate a three or four percent inflation world, and in wage growth, especially for the lower end, does not at least match that. These people that have less than $10,000 of savings, they lose every month. When they go to the store, they buy less things because the prices are rising faster than their paycheck. They don't have savings. They don't own SPY. They don't own their home to offset that. So the Fed is very acutely, or I should say acutely aware of this issue and this is why they need to crush inflation down so that wage growth and inflation is at least equal, if not prices rising slower than wage growth, which is what it did pre-pandemic. If they just say 3% or 4% is the target, uh, good luck 55%, but hey, all you guys that own SPY, enjoy 5,000, we'll have a revolution in this country if that's the way that we're going to go. That's why I don't think they can really back off that target until you get to 1% and then say, at that point, you know, we've fixed the problem. Maybe we could change yeah. it moving forward. 
Yeah, this, um, I don't want to get into politics, but almost comes a, a bit of a political issue too, don't you think? I mean, you know, the election is not that far off, you know, a little over a year. And obviously, uh, it's going to be pretty contentious. It's going to, on both sides, it's going to be, it's going to be bananas. I think it's going to be a, an absolute show. So um, a quick comment, was, a, yeah. a, a quick comment on that. Everybody always asks me the question, well, next year's an election year, right? So the Fed's not going to do anything. They sit on their hands at an election year. And I always like to say, you know, that's what they like to do is sit on their hands. But we have this funny thing that happens in the economy that all of the extreme stuff happens in election year 2020. The Fed had to do yeah. the that was an election year. They had to do the most extreme things they've ever done. 2008, that was an election year. That was a financial crisis. They were doing uh, they were doing unbelievable activities with Fed policy days before the meeting. 1992, they were doing cra They were they were raising rates. George H.W. Bush wrote in his memoirs, he personally blamed Greenspan for losing an election. 1980s, when they drove the rate, that was an election year, they drove interest rates to 21%. So January 1st, everybody comes in and says, that's it, the Fed's done, it's an election year. And then circumstances kind of force them to do wild things during an election year. So don't necessarily assume nothing's going to happen next year because it's an election year. It certainly didn't in 2020. I tell you what, after the pandemic, I, I don't assume anything anymore, Jim. I, you yeah. can't assume. I mean, it's, it's nothing you assume. When it, I mean, we've both been doing this a long time in the stock market. You can't assume anything. Right. So all this talk, I, I can't tell yet if you are bullish, bearish going forward in a market. Do you think a recession is going to happen or what are the odds of that? Um, kind of give your view on where you think, you know, and not just six months. Obviously, every, most people that watch the show are long term investors. But just curious if you think there's a recession on the uh, horizon, bear market, big pullback on the horizon. Uh, so I think that um, a recession at this. First of all, if you were to ask me, to be honest, I think the recession was last year. I think I agree. Negative, the two negative Jim, I, quarters. Yeah. I don't let me, let me cut you off, but I, I thank God you said that because, uh, you know, the, the fact that they kind of redefined what a recession was, was laughable to me. But yes, people always ask me about recession. I said, look at last year. Look at what the economy did last year. Look what the stock market did last year. That was a recession already. So I'm so right. happy you said that. Right. You know, you know, that everybody came out and said, just real quick on last year. Well, no one said that two consecutive quarter, negative quarters is a recession. And so but that is the only time in American history that we had two consecutive quarters and it wasn't declared a recession. Every other exactly. time was. And you had a 20 percent decline in the stock market in the worst bond market ever. That sounds <laughs> like we already had the recession last year. We yeah. just decided not to call it a recession is what we had. But going forward, yeah. I don't think we're going to see that negative growth that everybody uh, assumes. Now, um, my assumption here and all my comments I'm about to make is, you know, that there's not some war or, or some other exogenous event. So I don't think we're going to have a recession. But I think that the problem that that's going to bring about is the inflation rate is going to stay sticky at four or five percent. Interest rates are going to go up. They're going to remain a pressure on the economy, maybe not enough to put in um, a recession. And I think that when you look at the 493, while they're enjoying a little bit of a boomlet because of inflation being backed off, I think that those stocks are going to have a difficult time moving forward. The rest of them, the big seven, you can't dis discount them when you're talking about the, 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 um, the market. I think that, you know, they're driving, they're being driven by AI. And I, I believe the theory that when it comes to new technology, the market overestimates its impact in the short term, the AI stocks booming, and underestimates its impact in the long term. And so, yes, I think that this AI boom that we're having is going to be as transformational as the Internet, if not more. I don't know how it's going to play out. I think there's whole industries that are going to be created. I think that there's industries that are in trouble. The Hollywood strike is telling you they're panicking over it right now uh, that, you know, everybody they're going to they're going to replace Tom Hanks with a AI facsimile of him. <laughs> and they're going to make 15 Tom Hanks movies in a, a month without him actually having to lift a finger. So, yeah, they're worried about it. And, and Chet GBT is going to write all the scripts um, yep. a, a, as well. And so, yes, they're worried about it. it that's why they went on strike. Um, but uh, I think that in the in the near term. There's no reason that the AI stocks should stop. Uh, but if, if, if the inflation rate comes, I think the rest of the market is going to bifurcate, continue to bifurcate the way it has. 
Interest rates are going to continue to head higher. I don't think, um, you know, the dollar has been weakening. I don't think that that is a sustainable move. I think the dollar is going to at least bottom out, stabilize and start back up. Uh, and so I'm reasonably sanguine about the market. You know, the seven stocks continue to pull the, the, the indice higher. The rest of them are going to struggle because of higher rates. Um, but, you know, you've already got a 17% return this year in the S&P. You could still hold most of those gains, maybe add a little bit to it uh, as we move forward. So I'm not really trying to make a, a big call. My big call right now is I think inflation is going to continue to stay sticky. I think interest rates are going to continue to move higher. And I think that, yeah, even though 500 basis points is not proven to be a headwind, it is ultimately a headwind. Look, if you if you want to write off interest rates, here's a 12% mortgage. You want to buy a house? You told me interest rates don't matter. Here's a 15% mortgage. Yeah, yeah, eventually they're going to matter. And so I think that as interest rates continue to stay up and continue to move higher because inflation stays sticky, that's going to be a problem for the 493. But the seven are going to continue to go, you know, overestimate what AI is going to do in the short term. But ultimately, when you look at it 15 years from now, they're going to underestimate what its actual impact is. Yeah. So what would you say to people, Jim? You know, I, I feel that people are just so negative. Uh, you know, I've been in Nicaragua for the last three months, so it's a little different down here. I've kind of gotten away from negativity in the United States for some time, which has been very refreshing. I'll say that. I'm staring at the ocean. My surfboard's right there. That's a nice little way to live. But, you know, I'll be back in the States this weekend, and I feel like I'm at the airport, different places, talk to people. And you talk about the stock market and, oh, no, no, it's, I'm waiting for the crash to buy. I'm waiting for this to happen. I'm waiting for that to happen. Just the negativities around. What do you say to the average long-term investor, the retail investor that's waiting for that pullback or so scared to get in, sitting in cash? Um, how do you not necessarily convince them, but how do you kind of get through to them that, you know, long-term the market goes higher, that you can't really worry about everything? Well, I mean, first of all, on the on the part about everybody's negative, I I I like to quip. Do you blame them? I mean, we had a pandemic shutdown. We have dysfunctional government. We've got a lot of problems that can really, yeah, yeah. you know, really really depress you. But so yeah. the first thing I like to say is we have to separate some things here. We have a lot of issues. Uh, I live in Chicago, and that's a that's almost a triggering word for a lot of people. When I say yeah. Chicago, they think about crime and shooting and all that other stuff. Okay, that really bothers me too, but that doesn't have any impact on the S and P five hundred. Uh, and so, first, the first thing I like to say is, for all the issues and all the things you worry about, you have to ask yourself, does that change the earnings of the S and P five hundred? And for a lot of them, the answer is no. So, yes, you could be worried and pessimistic about certain things. But don't let it bleed into yeah. what you think the outlook for the economy might be or for earnings of a company you like or for the outlook of the market. It's that Those can be two different things. The market is going to be driven by financial and economic related factors like interest rates, outlook for the economy, taxes, you know, that kind of thing as well. So that would be the first that would be the first thing I would I would mention. The second thing is. Um, you did say, you know, about what about an investor sitting in cash? Now, that's going to be a little bit of a trickier one today because cash is giving you five and a half percent. The yeah. long term return of the stock market is supposed to be, according to the Ibbotson report, uh, studies and stuff, nine percent. Well, you're getting two thirds of the stock market's gain now without taking any risk in cash. Yeah. That's going to be hard to get people out of it. Yeah. In 2019, when you were getting zero in cash, that was a much different argument than you're than you're getting it than you're getting right now. Um, and so I think that people are going to have to understand that that is, first of all, break those two things apart. Cash is offering you something here. The stock market might offer you a little bit more, but it's also going to offer you more risk. Just remember back to last year. But I don't think you definitely want to be out of the game. You want to definitely have a plan. You want to look at what you're trying to accomplish. Look, as I said, AI might be overestimating the short term and underestimating the long term. That suggests to me that there is a tremendous AI play coming. It might not be NVIDIA. It might be something else, or maybe it is NVIDIA. Uh, but there is a tremendous AI play coming. And I, I want to be attuned to that. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, push back from that. In terms of, of, of uh, the economy, in terms of, of stocks, the last thing I like to tell people is, the stock market is different than the bond market or commodities. 
Bonds are a contract. Commodities are a thing. They cannot change. The stock market is run by people. Companies are organic. They can, you can look at a company and you can say, this business model doesn't work. Yeah, but as a company has the great benefit that they can change its business model. Yeah. It could become something else. It could fire management, bring in new management if management's not performing. You know, a bushel of wheat is a bushel of wheat and it, you cannot change it into something else. A, a, a bond is a contract of cash flows. It doesn't change unless you default on it, which is a negative anyway. So don't discount the idea that companies, and I think that's what people forget about with a lot of these companies, they remake themselves. They become something different. So have some optimism about companies. Yeah, these companies might be struggling. Um, look, Apple in 1997 was minutes yeah. away from going bankrupt. And it was like, you know, a single digit stock that was really struggling doing nothing. Um, and then they brought back Steve Jobs and he and we all know what happened after that. So don't give up on, th on those companies. The only thing that would worry me is or the benefit the U.S. has over the rest of the world, because the U.S. stock market has been really outperforming everybody else for the last several years, is we have that creative destruction. We allow companies to remake themselves and bend and fold and shape and do things, whereas in a lot of other countries, they become kind of status, bureaucratic, uh, you know, institutions. They really can't get out of their own way. And I think Japan, or when I say that, and that, um, that, and then they they don't give you any decent return. Think again, Japan. It's been 33 years, 33 years since the Nikkei made its all time high, um, and so their view of the stock market, their view of companies, is very different there than ours is. We allow that creative destruction here, and I think that is a virtue of our system. If we were to ever pull that away from us and turn these companies into status bureaucrats, then I'd be very worried. But fortunately, we're not going that way right now. Yeah, I'd be worried about the future of this country if that were to happen. Uh, you know, that that's kind of gives us that leg up. That would be very concerning to me uh, in future generations. Um, that was a great explanation, Jim. I really appreciate that. Before I let you go, I always ask every guest that I call it the island question. If I were to send you, your family, your friends, maybe you want to go alone, who the hell knows, to an island for 10 years, What's the one investment you're going to put in your portfolio? It could be an asset class, it could be a stock, it could be anything you want, it could be cash, something that you feel very comfortable with looking away for 10 years and, and open up your portfolio and get back and be very happy about it. Oh, wow. The island, the island investment. Um, you know, it, you know, not having to think about it, and I don't want to go anything specific, I would just have to say the SPY. I still yeah. think that ultimately – the, the, the stock market is going to continue to perform. But feeding off my last comments, if you, if you bought SPY, I think you'll see it's much higher in 10 years. But if you look at the big companies in SPY today and what they're doing in 10 years, when you come back and you say, what are the big companies and what are they doing then? It'll be a very different set, but yes. they'll be part of the same index. And that's why diversification seems to work. Um, in that regard. So it's not a bet that NVIDIA is going to keep going up and Apple's going to keep dominating. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But I think that American business with its competitive attitude will continue to, you know, churn forward. And yeah, though in that 10 years that I'm gone, and sometimes I feel like sitting on a uh, desert island by myself for 10 years is a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, there'll be some thrill rides along the way. There always is. Uh, but yeah, I think that over the long term, I still think that the outlook for the American economy and the U.S. financial system is is good. Yeah, you make a great point before they go, Jim, about how 10 years from now, uh, the top 10 stocks or that, the Magnificent Seven, what do you call them, will likely look very different in 10 years from now. And we just, my team just did a study recently, you know, many people did studies on it, but just looking at the changes over the years. Uh, I was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Bethlehem Steel used to be one of the largest companies in the world. It was a Dow 30 stock. You know, went bankrupt, shut down the whole city, basically. But you just see how, how things have changed. It's, it's amazing going back 120 years, how the, the Dow components and then the S&P components since that was uh, created have changed. And it's almost as if we I can't even envision what the top seven will be in 10 years from now. I mean, there's going to be not companies only, that you and I would never think of that are be top seven. Yeah, not only that. And even if, even if, you know, a Google or an Apple or a Microsoft are in the top seven, the products they're selling today that are making them all their money will be obsolete in 10 years. Yes. And the bet is that the iPhone 18 
will be, or the iPhone 20 or wherever we are in 10 years, will be as relevant as the iPhone 14 is today. And that Samsung or somebody else will not come along and create a better mousetrap for them. And if Samsung or somebody else does um, come along and create a better mousetrap, then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that um, at, at that point. But that's why you want to invest in an index. You mentioned Bethlehem Steel. And I was, when you thought about that, what popped into my mind is, Think about where Tesla was 10 years ago and think about where Tesla yes. is now in terms of its impact on the auto industry. Let's just leave it at that um, relative to all the auto. It is larger market cap than the next large nine largest auto companies combined. And it is it, without look, we would would we be anywhere about talking about electric cars if Tesla didn't exist? Tesla has forced that into the forefront. So the point is, is yes, that's what. The whole idea of diversification is is that um, do not think that you know um, I hate Apple because uh, they're only going to sell nine uh, iPhone 14s for the rest of time. No, they're not. They're going to create more and better products. Now, you know, maybe their 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 augmented reality head headset doesn't work. Fine, they'll find something else. So that's what you have to uh, that's what you have to believe in with uh, American companies. That's why I would say it, ten years. I'll, I'll just go with SPY. Yeah, it's a, it's a great investment because you're going to capture that. You're not trying to pick a specific company and taking that risk. You're going to capture that innovation, that growth, uh, all the technological breakthroughs but that we don't even know is going to happen yet in the future, whether it's healthcare, whether it's electric vehicles, whether it's autonomous vehicles or flying cars, who the hell knows? You'll, have, you'll be able to capture that with the S&P 500. Hey, Jim, listen, thank you so much for coming on. I've been a big fan of yours for a long time, so I really appreciate you taking time today. And I uh, would love to get you back on soon and uh, see uh, where these interest rates go and inflation is by the end of the year. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.